We've all seen the magnetic force in action just about every day. But what exactly is it? Like the force due to an electric field, the magnetic force also works on electric charges, but in a different way. If a charge Q moves with a velocity V through a magnetic field defined by the magnetic flux density vector B, it experiences a force F given by the cross product of QV with B, pointing in a direction perpendicular to both the V and B vectors. This force will move positive charges to the right in the view shown, and negative charges will move to the left. Moving charge is the very definition of current, and if we flow a current in the direction shown through a conducting material placed in this magnetic field, the positive charges will accumulate on the right side of the material, and the negative charges will accumulate on the left side. This creates a potential difference across the material that can be measured and directly correlated to the magnetic field that caused it. This is known as the Hall effect, and it is used in a wide variety of sensing applications, including current probes, which we will discuss a bit more shortly. If the magnetic force can deflect the path of charges on current-carrying conductors, then clearly it can also move the physical conductors that are carrying those currents. This simple apparatus shows that the magnetic force can rotate this coil of wire with a current flowing through it. Now, suppose we step up the scale, apply more power, and connect some mechanical object to the axis of rotation. We get rotating machinery, motors. This is a simple ceiling fan like you probably have in your house, but of course the principle can be applied on a much larger scale to motors of all shapes and sizes. So, if the magnetic force can move mechanical objects like this fan, do you think it can impact electronic circuits on a much smaller scale? You bet it can. And that brings us to Ampere's law and Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. Ampere's law generally states that a current will generate a magnetic field surrounding it. Sometimes this is shown as the magnetic field intensity vector H in units of amperes per meter, and sometimes it's shown as the magnetic flux density vector B in units of Weber's per square meter, or Tesla. These terms are related but distinct, and it is important to understand the difference. We'll come back to the flux density presently, but for the moment, we'll stick with the field intensity H. What generally comes to mind is current flowing through a conductor, which we'll call the conduction current I sub C. This is sometimes shown as a current density J in amperes per square meter, integrated over a surface S defined by the cross-sectional area of the conductor. It also applies to the displacement current I sub D, resulting from a time-varying potential and electric field in a dielectric. Recall from our session on electric fields that the electric flux density is defined as the electric field multiplied by the permittivity. The total electric flux, or charge, passing through a surface is given by the integral of the flux density through that surface, and the total displacement current is given by the time rate of change of that charge. The total current is then the sum of the conduction and displacement currents. We have just set up the right side of Ampere's law, and these terms should not look so scary now that you see where they come from. Of course, in a conductor, the first term dominates, and in a dielectric, the second term dominates, but the point is that a magnetic field will be generated by any type of current. That brings us to the left side of Ampere's law, which states that the magnetic field intensity integrated over a closed contour is equal to the total current passing through the surface bounded by the contour. Assuming a long current carrying element, we can define our contour to be a circle of radius r with the current at the center. Then the integral becomes h multiplied by the circumference 2 pi r. Solving for h, we get current divided by 2 pi r. For a current of 1 ampere and a circumference of 1 meter, that is a radius of 1 meter divided by 2 pi, we have a magnetic field intensity of 1 ampere per meter. The units tell you that magnetic field is directly related to current. 
Now we have all the terms of Ampere's law defined and understood. Again, the basic message is that a current creates a magnetic field, and this equation gives you a tool for quantifying it. Ampere's law is also sometimes shown in its differential form, stating that the curl of the magnetic field intensity equals the current density J plus the permittivity times the time derivative of the electric field. Here again, I prefer to use the integral form because it provides a more intuitive description, but you'll need to be able to recognize both forms when you come across them. Magnetic fields and magnetic flux lines follow what we call the right hand rule. If you point your thumb in the direction of current flow along your wire or cable, then the magnetic fields and magnetic flux lines will wrap around the wire in the direction of the fingers of your right hand. That's really all there is to it. We'll be hearing about the right hand rule quite a lot, but there it is. The magnetic flux density B is equal to the magnetic field intensity H multiplied by a material property called the permeability designated by the Greek letter mu. This relationship between B and H is analogous to the relationship between electric flux density and electric field, which are related by the permittivity of the material. As we just discussed, the permittivity determines the available charge that can form a displacement current in a given electric field. On a larger scale, this is equivalent to saying that the capacitance determines the available charge for a given potential. Similarly, the permeability determines the available magnetic flux from a given magnetic field that can cause electromagnetic induction. This is the very point of Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction, which we will discuss presently. But first, what of this mu, this permeability? Permeability is the product of the relative permeability, mu sub r, and the permeability of free space, or vacuum, mu zero or mu naught. Mu naught equals 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 henries per meter, or approximately 1.26 microhenries per meter. Again, these numbers are worth committing to memory because we will use them all the time. The henry is the unit of inductance, and for that reason, I like to think of permeability informally as inductivity. And as with permittivity, the per meter portion only takes on physical meaning when it is applied to a specific geometry. The relative permeability is a dimensionless constant specific to a given material. For ferromagnetic materials, such as nickel, cobalt, or iron, mu sub r can be in the hundreds or thousands, but most non-ferromagnetic materials, including air, wire insulation, and most conductors of interest, including aluminum and copper, mu sub r is very close to 1, and that is the number we will be using most often. Going back to Ampere's law and the magnetic field intensity H resulting from a current, we multiply H by the permeability to get the magnetic flux density B expressed in units of Weber's per square meter, or Tesla. It is also sometimes expressed in Gauss, where one Tesla equals 10,000 Gauss, or one Gauss equals 0.1 millitesla. The total magnetic flux through a closed surface, designated by the Greek letter phi, equals the integral of the flux density over that surface. The negative time rate of change of that flux will produce a potential, also known as an electromotive force, or EMF, in the contour enclosing the surface. The significance of the negative sign is that the induced EMF will oppose or impede the incident magnetic flux. This principle is known as Lenz's law. The induced EMF can be written as the line integral of the electric field along the contour. And with that, we have arrived at the full expression of Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. It is essentially impossible to overstate the significance of Faraday's law. That a time-changing magnetic flux can induce a potential is the very principle that facilitates the conversion of mechanical power to electrical power, and it makes possible such devices as the transformer that facilitates the distribution of that electrical power over very large areas.
This particular law of physics forms a large part of the backbone of modern civilization, and without it, the world and the universe would be a far less interesting place. With induction being part of the name of Faraday's law, and because we are talking about an induced potential, then clearly inductance is part of this picture. Inductance is defined as the magnetic flux through a loop divided by the current that caused it. Thus, it is essentially the magnetic flux normalized to a current of one ampere. This can be the self-inductance in the same loop as the applied current, or it can be the mutual inductance into a neighboring circuit. Breaking down the units of magnetic flux density to henries per meter times amperes divided by meters, then integrating over a surface area in square meters, then dividing by the current in amperes, the square meter terms cancel to give inductance in henries. Thus, just as with permittivity, the per meter portion of permeability takes on physical meaning only when applied to a specific geometry. Getting back to Faraday's law, it's also sometimes shown in its differential form, stating that the curl of the electric field is equal to the negative time derivative of the magnetic flux density. And yes, you guessed it, I like the integral form better, but you'll need to recognize both forms when you see them. Recalling the more intuitive version that states that a time-changing magnetic flux induces a potential, or EMF, in a loop, and recalling the definition of inductance that it is the magnetic flux per unit current, we can rewrite it to show that the magnetic flux equals the inductance times the current. Substituting for flux and taking inductance to be constant, we get that the magnitude of the potential equals the inductance multiplied by the time rate of change of the current. Looking at the frequency domain representation of the current and the time derivative of it, we see that the magnitude of the potential equals j omega l times the current. Dividing the potential by the current gives the impedance or inductive reactance of j omega l or 2 pi f l. Thus, the inductive reactance increases with increasing frequency. If this refers to the self-inductance of a loop, this means that for a given applied potential, the resulting current will decrease with frequency. If this refers to the mutual inductance from a current-carrying conductor into a neighboring circuit, this means that the inductive coupling will increase with frequency. You'll see this demonstrated shortly. Ampere's law and Faraday's law are both illustrated very nicely with a device that we'll be using all the time, a clamp-on magnetic core current probe. When you clamp it on a wire, which we'll do in just a moment, the magnetic flux generated by the current in the wire will be captured by the magnetic core in the probe. And the flux through the core couples through a coil of wire wrapped around it, generating a voltage per Faraday's law that is sent to the output connector that then you can connect to an oscilloscope, spectrum analyzer, or any other measurement device to tell you what was the current that generated that magnetic flux and potential. To make a measurement, you simply clamp the current probe around the wire or cable of concern without demating or disturbing its configuration in any way. It's much less invasive than a voltage measurement. And as we'll see, it's much more directly related to the parameter of concern. We're generally much more concerned about where current is flowing, and this tells us precisely that. We're back to using our wire above ground test fixture, which we'll be using over and over again, as you'll see. We're running a signal through our wire into channel one of the oscilloscope where we're reading the voltage. And we are reading a voltage of about five volts peak to peak. And channel one is set for the 50 ohm input. So five volts peak to peak into 50 ohms should give us a current of right around 100 milliamps peak to peak. The current probe is connected to channel two of the oscilloscope, and it's giving us a reading of right around 100 millivolts peak to peak. Now you might be saying, aren't we reading current? Why are we reading a voltage? Well, the oscilloscope only knows what potential 
the device is putting into it. So to get the current, we need to know what the probe factor is or the transfer impedance of this probe. And we'll talk about transfer impedances and calibration of current probes in a future session. But for right now, I will just tell you that I know that the transfer impedance of this current probe is right around one ohm at this frequency, above about 200 kilohertz. The transfer impedance is right around one ohm. So I know that 100 millivolts peak to peak equates to right around 100 milliamps peak to peak, and that's right what we expect. So we can use a current probe to directly measure the current, which a lot of times is a lot more interesting and is a lot more important to us than the potential. Another type of current probe that's very handy is the Hall effect probe, based on the Hall effect that we discussed earlier. It also senses the magnetic flux around a wire and generates a potential that then can be measured on an oscilloscope to tell you what current caused it. These are very handy because they are meant to plug directly into an oscilloscope and the oscilloscope will sense the probe and do the conversion from voltage to current for you and display the value in current right, right on the screen so that you don't have to do the conversion based on the probe factor. One disadvantage is that they do tend to be made specifically for oscilloscopes. You can really only plug them into a specific oscilloscope for which they were made. And they do require an external power source to generate the current through the, the loop that goes around the magnetic element. The magnetic core current probe is very handy because it is a completely passive device, requires no external power source, and you can plug it into any device you choose, an oscilloscope, spectrum analyzer, network analyzer, or any other device that it'll connect to. So two different types of current probes, each well suited to different types of measurements. So now a question for you. If the current in this wire generates a flux that can be picked up by this current probe that you can see on the oscilloscope, do you think that flux could possibly couple into a neighboring circuit and cause some disruptions? I think you know the answer. I've gone back to our two wire configuration on our fixture, but with a couple of important differences to configure it for inductive or magnetic coupling. Because inductive coupling is about current, we want to make sure that we have a path for current to flow on both wires. Channel one of the scope, which the culprit wire is still connected to, is now set up for a 50 ohm input to allow much more current to flow than the one mega ohm input. Also, I have put a 50 ohm terminator on the input side of the victim wire circuit to allow current to flow in that loop. Because magnetic or inductive coupling is dependent on the current on the culprit wire, I've connected this Hall effect current sensor to the culprit wire and connected it to channel three of our oscilloscope so that we can monitor it directly. The applied signal on our culprit wire is five volts peak to peak, giving a current into the 50 ohm oscilloscope input of 100 milliamps peak to peak. Per Ampere's law, this current will generate a magnetic flux through the loop formed by the victim wire above the ground plane, and per the right-hand rule, this flux will point into the screen or toward the wall in the test configuration. This magnetic flux is equal to the mutual inductance between the culprit wire and the victim wire loop multiplied by the culprit current. I'll estimate this mutual inductance to be approximately 700 nanohenries. In the next session, I will show you how to calculate the inductance for different configurations, including where this 700 nanohenries number comes from. Per Faraday's law, the time rate of change of the magnetic flux will induce a potential in the victim loop, which can be written as the mutual inductance multiplied by the time rate of change of the culprit current. In the frequency domain, this equals j omega L sub m times I sub c, or 2 pi f. L sub m times I sub c. Per Lenz's law, the induced potential will oppose or impede the incident flux. Using the right-hand rule a second time, the thumb points outward from the wall in the direction of the opposing flux, and the fingers wrap around in the direction of the induced potential in a counterclockwise direction. We can now drop the negative sign from Lenz's law because of how we have defined the polarity of the coupled potential.
The resulting current in the victim circuit will flow through the pair of 50 ohm resistors in series, dropping half of the coupled potential across each one. Thus, at the scope input, the measured potential will be half the magnitude of the total coupled potential, and due to the direction of the current flow, it will have the opposite polarity. Because of this polarity flip, the positive peaks of the coupled potential will appear to lag the culprit current by 90 degrees. But what is happening physically is that the negative peaks of the potential are leading the current by 90 degrees. Because in an inductor, the voltage leads the current. At our starting frequency of 100 kHz and plugging in the remaining numbers into our equation, we should expect to see a measured potential on the scope of about 22 millivolts peak to peak. The upper yellow trace is the potential on our culprit wire, showing the applied level of 5 volts peak to peak. The lower purple trace is the current on our culprit wire, showing a level of 100 milliamps peak to peak, exactly as expected into the 50 ohm scope input. Because the culprit current is really the parameter of interest, we can now disable the voltage trace for the culprit and turn on the voltage trace for our victim wire. At 100 kHz, the coupled potential is right around 20 millivolts peak to peak, which is very much in the ballpark of our predicted level of 22 millivolts peak to peak. Now we increase the frequency by a factor of 10 to 1 MHz, and the coupled potential also increases by about a factor of 10 to just shy of 200 millivolts peak to peak. So the circuit is behaving essentially as expected. As noted earlier, the positive peaks of the coupled potential appear to lag the positive peaks of the culprit current. But physically, the negative peaks of the potential are leading the current because that's how inductors and inductances work. So at one megahertz, the coupled potential is comparable to what we saw with capacitive coupling on the order of 200 millivolts peak to peak. And the same question applies. Do you necessarily care about this? Again, it all depends on the nature of your victim circuit. If you can tolerate this kind of ripple, then it's not a problem. But if it is a very sensitive signal line, say a telemetry point, where you're trying to, to read levels with one millivolt of sensitivity or, or lower, then this poses a significant problem. And just as with capacitive coupling, if you're saying, I'm a digital logic designer, I don't really care about any of this. Well, let's take a look at that. Let's change from a sine wave to a square wave to more accurately represent a digital logic signal. And now look at that. Let's collapse the scales a little bit so we can actually see what we're dealing with. Now we're seeing almost a volt of coupling onto our victim circuit as a result of this change in current on the culprit wire. We can zoom in a little bit, make some sense out of the levels we're seeing. Remember that the coupled potential equals the mutual inductance times the time rate of change of the culprit current. Remember also that the voltage read by the scope is half of the coupled potential and has the opposite sign. From the culprit current trace, we can estimate that the current is changing by about 60 milliamps over about 20 nanoseconds, giving a DIDT of about 3 amps per microsecond. Multiplying by the estimated mutual inductance of 700 nanohenries and dividing by 2, we get an estimated potential of 1.05 volts. The measured potential on the scope is about 0.9 volts, which is right in the ballpark, and it goes negative when the culprit current goes positive, as expected. And just as we discussed with capacitive coupling, if you see these kinds of transients, coupling onto your circuits from inductive coupling, this can be very bad for a digital circuit. These kinds of glitches coupled onto a clock line can completely freeze up a state machine and render it useless. So there's your introduction to magnetic fields and how they relate to current and inductance. In the next session, I'll show you how to apply what we just learned to analyze and calculate the inductance of different configurations that will come in handy. See you next time.